So in the project, I've put um, two references that I asked you to provide. I put those into the uh, project, and the, the, the output of those tracks goes directly to the stereo output of the session, um, whereas above them, we have the, the mix bus, and that is, um, that's, the, you know, that's our current mix. And just by holding the option and clicking on the solo button, I can quickly swap between these three different references just to quickly like check um, where we're at, and I'm going to be doing that a lot throughout the session. So on the kick, um, I've put uh, a sort of a fairly typical chain. The Waves NLS Nonlinear Summer is kind of a favorite of mine. It, it's uh, an emulation of a, of a real-world mixer, and I like to use the mic mode for things that have kind of lower mid-range weights. Typically works quite well on that stuff, and I'm just basically bringing things back up to level um, applying gain, um, and then running that into, in this case, um, the Saturn again. And I, I'm going to be playing around with this Saturn um, a lot to try and find, like, find the right result that I'm looking for. The sounds in your session are really quite good. Everything sounds nice. Um, so really, a lot of the work that I've been doing on this is about controlling dynamics, um, and. Uh, there's a variety of different ways that I might do that, um, and one of them is with compression, obviously. This particular compressor, the VC160, is especially good when I want to, um, uh, when I want there to be like sort of a spiky, very short um, attack, and almost like a poppy transient as on percussive sounds like a kick drum. Um, so I'm running um, the kick through the 160 to get that spikiness back um, because I want to drive a much more dynamic um, kick into Saturn here and um, hopefully find this sort of idealized um, configuration of different bands and different amounts of um, compression and distortion. Um, and here I've loaded up Decapitator, which is another um, you know, uh, method of doing that, we're just kind of putting the squeeze on the kick, you know, um, sort of applying it on multiple levels, I'm trying out different algorithms. I think I settled on this T algorithm, uh, this T style, um, trying out the low cut and the high cut, seeing what kind of an effect it has on the sort of tone at the very bottom end. And I think I just decided to get rid of thump. It's like a sort of, um, uh, thump is like a, uh, a slight resonance boost on the high pass filter. Moving on to the snare. Um, you know, the, the problem I was having with the snare is that there really wasn't very much um, low, lower mid range. Um, uh, presence to uh, the snare. It really didn't sort of hit you in the chest at all. It was very sort of thin in the very upper frequencies. So um, I've taken some strategies to try and uh, accentuate the low mid-range of the snare. And in this case, I'm using Volcano and I'm getting an envelope um, follower uh, in... I'm using the um, transient mode. I've found there's two modes, envelope mode and transient mode, and as you can see, envelope mode doesn't react fast enough. Transient mode, however, gives me the kind of the snap that I'm looking for. Um, so, you know, this is something else that gets sort of dialed in progressively, massaged into place, and I'm kind of looking for... Um, I'm just looking for this biting point where um, it just allows a, a tiny fraction of the high frequencies through to kind of give that attack, but really it's accentuating the low mid-range, especially with a little resonance boost, and then I'm gaining it up. So there's a lot of, you know, bringing things up to level. Um, as you can see, there was a gain um, there running into the volcano, and here I am just kind of massaging the, um, the decay time on the envelope follower, changing the filter cutoff, trying these different filter models until I find something that I feel is working for me. Um, you know, there's this resonant sound to the filter, which I don't, I don't want it to squeal too much. I don't really like the sound of a squealing filter very much. So, um, just trying to make it subtle enough, but it knocks. It has this knock in the lower mid-range. 
Um, at this point, I decide that I'm going to need to split the snare into two layers, low and high. So this low pass filter trick will obviously not be present on the high one. And the high one is going to allow the fizzy, you know, almost white noise characteristic of the snare through. So I'm basically building a snare out of a mixture between the low and the high. Um, and here we are with a noise gate again, just kind of controlling the dynamics of the high layer. And because um, it's the high layer, I don't need any of the lower mid-range frequencies, so I've put a high pass filter on the high layer and I'm just slicing off all the, all the frequencies I don't really need. And then, um, you know, noise gates, I use a hell of a lot in this kind of situation. Um, attack at zero, look ahead up to a certain amount so that it doesn't kind of um, pop and click at you. Um, but, uh, you know, in combination with the noise gate and the um, enveloped low pass filter, I'm kind of finding this kind of ideal um, uh, this ideal tone. I figure I'm probably going to want to accentuate the stereo-ness of this snare. I want it to be kind of wide, so this is something that I've been doing recently is using um, Sound Toys MicroShift, um, putting the delay to a very short and setting the focus to the... Um, actually, I should have set that higher, so that was a mistake. I should have set the focus up to a high frequency rather than down low. Addressing the hats now, I'm feeling that there should be some reverb um, on the hats and indeed other elements of the drums, so setting up an auxiliary send, loaded up uh, a, an impulse response reverb plugin in Logic, and um, sending a bit from the hats into it. And then I chose a kind of a, a long, um, a, a sort of a folder full of long uh, decay impulse responses and landed on this one here, Prince Hall, that I think I like. And so I'm going to be sending other, other elements of the drums into, um, into this reverb um, send, auxiliary send. I'm loading up um, a VC160 here, again on the low snare to add more um, more dynamics, more punch to the lower mid-range of the snare. So just looking for that biting point on the threshold, um, just so that it knocks, you know, it's like, it's like a punch. Uh, and after that, I'm putting um, a high pass filter, cutting away the garbage frequencies. Just kind of looking to shave off the lowest fundamental. So you're just kind of shearing it rather than outright cutting it all the way off. And, you know, still more tweaking of the envelope. Obviously, if you turn up the intensity of the modulation, you're going to allow more of those upper frequencies in. And I want a little bit of that just for snap, but not too much. Okay, so auditioning all the, um, or some, nearly all of the drum elements together, kick, hats, snares together, seeing how they work together, and then finding that I don't quite, not quite happy with how the kick drum is um, sitting, and I'm sort of looking for, um, looking for the right configuration of this Saturn. And I found that by creating a third band in that kind of 200 to 500 band and just um, dipping that a little bit and compensating and by allowing more of the upper mid-range slap, I eventually came upon a, a configuration that I felt was really working. Um, and it wasn't dominating too much in that lower mid-range zone, but there's enough of the low lows really carrying the weight of it and I was finding that I was liking the way it was sitting better with the other drum elements and hopping over to the noise gate 
and just dialing that in a bit. I'm actually raising the level of reduction so that it doesn't completely mute the, um, the high snare, but it just kind of attenuates it. So we allow this initial transient snap through at the, at the beginning, but it just kind of envelopes down to something a little more reasonable. Um, over on the open hat, again, doing a very similar thing. I'm using a noise gate um, to allow the initial transient through, but then um, setting the threshold and release time appropriately and the amount of reduction so that you get a, a, a punchier, spikier transient on the open hat and then it just ducks down to, in this case, only a minus 9 dB reduction. Um, at this point, I'm trying to get a good balance between the different high percussion elements, open hat, ride cymbal in particular, trying to get a good balance between the two of those. Um, here I am adding a Saturn onto the ride. Um, because almost everything can benefit from at least a little saturation. So I'm using the clean tape um, algorithm for that and just squeezing the rides a bit. Um, and then I, I decide that I need to change the, um, the configuration of the bussing because I want the open hat and the ride to be bussed to their own, uh, like to one group together. Um, whereas I want the regular hi-hats to have their own separate group. So that's what's happening here. I'm putting the rides and the open hats into one group that I'm called OH Ride, and then I'm making sure the open hat is in its own um, group called Hat. So that's what's happening there. Um, and now you can do a copy and paste channel strip setting. So I'm just getting those plugins that I had previously on the hi-hats. I'm now getting onto this new channel I just created overhead, uh, sorry, open hats and ride, and um, just sort of dialing in some compression to clamp down on the most aggressive peaks, finding a right balance on the channel fader. So I'm pretty much feeling this mix I have for the drums now. This is all kind of feeling coherent to me. Decided to take just very gently, very, very gently low pass filter some of the highest of the high uh, snare of sounds just to kind of tame those really, really bright frequencies a little bit. Moving on to the snare here, same deal as before, kind of gaining things up using Waves NLS. Typically I just apply 6 dB of gain at the input um, in addition to whatever gain plugin goes before it just to, so that I see the needle going somewhere near the kind of optimal red zone of that plugin. And then on the clap, just taking out some of the low frequencies because we don't really need them. Uh, copying and pasting this configuration from clap to the rim shot, uh, and because I pretty much want a very similar kind of um, processing chain for those. Um, again, trying out a noise gate, but actually the rim shot is so short that it doesn't need a noise gate. Um, but you know, kind of doing a lot of the same tricks using VC 170, or sorry, 160 to get that kind of spikiness. So I've put um, a sidechain compressor on both the overhead slash ride track and also the hi hats track, keying them to the kick drum. Um, I use a, a slow attack typically. Um, so as to allow the first hit of the ride or the hi-hat or whatever, when it's on the downbeat, I typically want to allow that through. So I have a slow attack, um, but then the compressor bites down. And similarly, uh, I then do this exact same thing to the entire drums bus. So this of course is the group that contains all the drums minus the kick drum, setting up the kick drum as the side chain input. And um, in this case, decided on a different model of compressor. Uh, again, with a slow attack, um, uh, just allowing the initial transient through and looking for roughly 6 dB of gain reduction. And finally, just uh, adjusting the mix so that it's roughly 50-50, so it's not too obvious, but it has this subtle but cumulative effect. So 50% wet dry mix on this compressor. And at this point, I decide that I'm kind of close to being happy with the drums and let's hear what it sounds like with the acid stuff.
And obviously that didn't sound very good, but we're gonna fix all that. So we are starting with just the 303 low and the kick drum, soloing, soloing those together and seeing how they interact. And the first process is to bring the 303 low up to gain using the same um, Waves NLS um, plugin, 6 dB of gain at the input. Um, and I'm about to put a sidechain compressor in between them. Um, we're again, keying to the kick. Typically looking for 6 dB of reduction using peak mode so it responds faster. Here I am thinking I'm being clever by using a high pass filter mode on the detection, but I didn't turn the filter on, so it's doing nothing. <laughs> but the compressor is still doing its job. So I'm finding that the 303, the low 303, kind of honks in this 200 hertz zone. It kind of, um, you know, it kind of dominates a little bit, it jumps out. So I'm using a fairly precise dynamic EQ around that 200 um, hertz spike. And I'm looking for this sort of biting point, um, adjusting the threshold um, and the amount of gain reduction so that it's just kind of levels out that low mid-range honk then, you know, slicing off the lowest of the lows. Moving on to the 303 mid. Um, I have a Logix multimeter up. I'm just kind of curious about what, if any, stereo content exists in any of these recordings, and I can see there's a little bit. So I may be trying to pick that out later. Um, but right now on the, on the 303 mid, um, again, doing the typical slicing off the garbage frequencies. And here again, I'm kind of like shaving off the lowest fundamental. So I'm just kind of giving it a haircut um, with this high pass filter. So, because it's really the character is this like first fundamental and, and above. Now this particular sound is a great candidate to use spiff, uh, which I don't use too often um, or haven't yet, but this is a really great scenario to use spiff. Um, and if you don't know spiff and soothe, um, they are basically dynamic automatic multiband EQ. Yeah, dynamic multiband EQ is effectively what it is. And I'm using this EQ curve to say, like these are the frequencies that I want spiff to operate on. And what spiff is basically doing is, um, boosting certain frequencies once they exceed the threshold and the depth that big dial is the strength of it and then you have things like sensitivity and sharpness and stuff like that and I found that um, I could really get the 303 to sound kind of spiky and like punchy and really spit really spit at you and I felt like this particular sound the mid-range 303 was just sounding really good um, through spiff so yeah um, that's what I'm doing here. And uh, using Delta, you can actually um, hear what Spiff is actually doing, which is kind of cool. And just dialing in a 50-50 mix here, um, because as with most of these things, you don't want them to be too obvious, and it's a cumulative effect that you're looking for. Unsurprisingly, I'm going to copy and paste that um, plugin configuration from 303 mid to 303 high because it also benefits very nicely from spiff. So this is me just playing around with it and trying a few different options. But as you can see from the EQ curve, it's all about targeting the upper mid range and um, using the boost mode and significant amounts of depth and sharpness to just kind of dial in um, something that has a bit of spit and dynamics. All throughout this whole process I'm trying to inject more dynamics into, into the mix. Okay. 
certain point, I felt like I could hear something interfering with the snare, like a little flamming, a little um, kind of clickiness, where the transients aren't quite lining up. And, and I had a little look into the WAV file of um, the, uh, the high 303. And I saw that, like, you know, we weren't quite lining up. Um, with the transients, with the grid. And I figure, you know what, I'm just gonna move this whole thing back a little bit, somewhere closer to where the snare should land, where the downbeat should land. And I, I feel, I'm pretty sure that that tightened up the groove just a little bit and took away the kind of flamming that I was hearing. I'm pretty sensitive to that kind of thing. So um, that's what I'm doing here, I'm just kind of nudging the 303 around a little bit to see if I can find a slightly better position for it and I think this is good. And in this situation here I've added another sidechain compression on the 303 mid keyed to the 303 high. This time I have remembered to engage the high pass filter for detection and I'm just getting it to dance around the 303 high. Uh, moving on to these Hydrosynth dub chords or these dub stabs, um, high pass filter, just finding that lowest harmonic. Um, Pro Q3 has this awesome feature where you push and hold that little micro, uh, headphone button and you hear what is being rejected or which, which uh, frequencies this particular band are affecting. So again, I'm giving the low mid range or the lows of this sound a bit of a haircut, just kind of slicing off the lowest fundamental because I don't think we're gonna need it when we've got so many other elements, you know, kind of using up that, um, that 200 to 500 zone. Uh, and then I also noticed there was a bit of a hiss in the recording, so I've done a fairly steep low pass filter at the very, very upper range to just kind of get rid of some of the, the highest frequencies. And then uh, noise gate, again, finding the biting point for the, the dub chords. Um, you know, fastest attack, look ahead. Actually, I don't need such a fast attack. It doesn't really matter. Um, just dialing in the release time so that it has the kind of um, envelope that I like, but then raising the reduction level so that it's not completely silencing the sound. It's just, you know, allowing that transient through and then, and then enveloping it down a little bit. This is all about controlling the dynamics of every individual sound. So when I bring the Hydrosynth wave stabs in and, you know, have them soloed with the dub stabs, you know, there's a little bit of masking. So what I'm doing here is I'm putting a high pass filter on the Hydrosynth dub, uh, keying it using the uh, sidechain input, keying that to the uh, Hydrosynth wave and using an envelope um, follower to to basically open, uh, to move the cutoff point of the high pass filter up when those chord stabs hit. And as you can see, it just kind of gets things out of the way. Just dialing in the attack and decay and the actual strength of the effect or the strength of the modulation so that just, just subtly takes out the low mids when the hydrosynth wave comes in. More housekeeping, EQ, high pass filtering out the garbage low, low frequencies of this Hydrosynth wave. Just looking for that ideal biting point. And then also adding a shelf because I don't want to completely cut out that low mid range, but I want to attenuate it. Uh, equally with this Hydrosynth downlifter sound, I noticed that there was a sort of a tone to it um, that was interfering with the sort of melody, so I just decided to completely cut out the low, low frequencies of that. Uh, at this point, I am adding an extra melodic submix for reverb, so I just unhid um, one of the uh, auxiliary tracks and I'm copy pasting the reverb from the drums effects channel to the melodic effects channel, the reverb channel. 
that included the icon. Uh, so changing that back. Um, but ultimately wanting to send from the hydrosynth wave and I think a little bit from dub to that reverb. Just to try and fill out the atmosphere a bit. Um, in this case, I allowed the length to be a little longer than, uh, than the drums. Uh, yeah, as I was kind of progressing through the mix, I was really finding that that low mid-range shelf just wasn't quite doing it um, to control the hydrosynth um, dub. Uh, you know, I find it would kind of like jump out at certain points. It's kind of a little unruly. So I'm trying different strategies to tame those low mid frequencies. Um, I think this particular passage here ultimately sort of fails, but I do come back to it later. Um, but I'm using the dynamic EQ function of Pro Q3 um, on the shelf, setting the appropriate threshold and, and the gain reduction. Just having a quick check of the references to see where I'm at, just to kind of remind myself what the target is. And, you know, getting closer and closer, feeling, feeling like I'm moving in the right direction. Uh, I mentioned earlier about there being some stereo content in these 303 recordings, I think mainly from a reverb that was baked into the recording. And what I've done is um, I want to pick that out. So I've loaded up this compressor in mid-side mode. And what I'm doing is I'm muting the mid um, so that we only hear the sides right now. So if you're listening in mono, it'll be completely silent. But this is a technique I use to kind of balance or to, to control the width of a signal by splitting, you know, to mid and side and just using the output of side to kind of control the overall width. And I'm checking um, on my monitor controller, I'm flipping to mono um, as I do these things, certainly when I have the mid mixed back in. I'm just trying to make sure that when I flip between mono and stereo, I'm not hearing too much change in tonality between, um, between the before and after. Um, I, I just want the sound to kind of surprisingly pop outwards a little bit to my left and right and just to kind of, you know, have that extra width, um, but not to sound tonally any different. I shouldn't be able to tell any difference if I'm not sitting in the mixed position. more strategies for more stereo interest. Um, at this point where the two 303 mid and high meet, I decide initially to try, you know, hard panning them at the moment where the um, 303 high comes in, but that sounded kind of weird. So instead I opted for a slow fade across the, um, across the break build up segment where they're slowly um, panning from a middle point to being very slightly to the left and right. I'm not trying to mix a record like the Beatles um, where they have, you know, um, sounds that are panned extremely hard to the left and right. Just trying to add a little bit of width um, to the whole affair. It's, it's relatively subtle, but in combination with the mid-side compression technique, you can really bring out the stereo width this way. This is me having another go at trying to tame this slightly unruly low mid-range, kind of almost like a honking honkiness in the Hydra dub track. And so I've changed that um, shelf to be a bell filter. Uh, and I'm just trying to find that particularly offensive band where that has been bothering me. Um, it kind of rings my ears a little bit. So I'm kind of looking for it moving the high pass filter to a point where I can hear that it's gone and then that's my clue like that's this is where this thing needs to be um, and so yeah it's just it's just leveling it out just kind of it's almost like sandpaper on a on a on a rough wooden sculpture you know you're kind of sanding over the um, uh, the unevenness and making something that's a, that's a little bit more controlled so just in combination with setting the correct 
um, threshold and band uh, frequency, I get the result that I'm looking for. Uh, I went back to the sidechain compression on the drum submix, just kind of dialing that in a little more. Bear in mind again that it is mixed 50-50, so it's not a full wet mix. So there's quite a lot of gain reduction there, but it's you know mixed 50-50, so it's not too much. Now, oof, that is loud. Um, another compression on the drum submix in mid side mode, exactly the same strategy as I've shown before on the 303. What I'm trying to do is really control the width um, by having effectively two compressors, one on just the mids and one on the sides. So on the sides, I will just cut out the low frequencies because you really don't need um, stereo width in the low mid range. You want that to be in mono. So um, using a mid side EQ after that compressor, I'm just high pass filtering the sides. And now I'm trying to um, begin to think about processing on the entire mix bus. So uh, first part of call again is the Waves NLS. Um, again in mic mode, applying 6 dB of gain. After that, I always reach for this solid bus comp um, from the event instruments. Um, you know, again, my rule of thumb is looking for roughly 6 dB of gain reduction on that compressor, but um, I will be using it in a parallel compressor style. And as you can see, I'm lowering the compressor's output and raising the dry level, which effectively is your wet-dry mix. Um, and so these two controls will become very, very um, important uh, in the final mix-down uh, limiting stage of, of this thing. Next up is the um, Waves, sorry, not Waves, Native Instruments Passive EQ. It's um, one of these Pultec style EQs. Um, loading up a high pass and a low pass on that and beginning the setup of um, a fairly typical uh, configuration on these types of EQs where you have one boost and one cut next to each other. So I'm looking at a low mid-range cut uh, and compensating with a low frequency shell boost. And later I'll be doing the same thing with the upper mid range and the high. And finally, at the end of the mastering chain, I'll be loading up the Waves L2 mastering limiter. And um, I'll be dialing in settings on that in a minute. Time for a quick reference check, see where we're at, see how I'm doing. I've decided because the Babbage track is a much more appropriate reference, um, I'm mainly going to focus on that from this point moving forward. And also because the level is now coming up on my master, I can now take the Babbage track back up to zero dB playback so that we can begin to actually compete um, with, with level. So I typically aim to apply roughly six dB of input gain on L2. And um, I, in this case, I went for the dynamic mode. Um, or the modern algorithm is also a good one. Um, but I think uh, dynamic or punchy would be the right thing for this. It's kind of hard to know exactly what's right, but I'm looking at 6 dB of, of, uh, of gain. I'll have a slow attack, a fast release, and I'll turn the channel linking off. All of these are purportedly able to give you 
um, greater loudness with the least amount of distortion. And that's basically the name of the game for me at this point. So my assessment comparing to the reference was that we're really kind of lacking a lot of the lower mid-range presence that our reference has. So the um, best way to address that I would say would be to bring up the 303 low level, a significant margin. And actually I forgot to gain that track up anyway um, using Waves NLS. So that's what I'm doing here, applying 60 view again, applying a bit of side chain compression against the kick as per usual. Uh, and just getting, you know, the dynamics um, between the kick and the low, uh, uh, the low 303 right. Just going back for another quick comparison, and I feel like I'm getting closer and closer. I'm feeling that weight um, is still there when I flip over to our mix. Um, the low 303 is kind of doing its job and filling in, filling in the, uh, the low mid range. You know, obviously the purpose isn't to make your track sound absolutely identical or extremely similar to the reference, but it's just a guide that can kind of keep you sane because the longer you work on a track, the less um, objective your ears become about what is a good balance. So the reference is there for that. I decided that the hi-hats were biting a little too hard, um, so I'm just applying more input gain on the compression for the op uh, open hat and ride track just to kind of bite down harder on those peaks of the hi-hats and just make it a little, a little smoother, a little fuller and less sort of spiky. And one final move I made was going back to the decapitator on the kick and just um, lowering the tone on the kick so that it just accentuates the low frequencies more just to fill out those lows, get a little bit closer to the reference. Um, I don't think that I've matched it exactly and I'm beginning to run out of time at this point. I could have and should have spent more time um, making more and more little adjustments it, it, it's all about this cumulative effect of, of many, many, many um, corrective moves to add up to like an idealized result. But, you know, um, I put a decent amount of time into it and feel like I got myself somewhere relatively close to the reference. The final check for me is on um, Dynameter here, which as I explained at the beginning of the tutorial is kind of a, a history of the dynamics of your music. And again, when I run the reference through it and compare it to our mix, I can get a decent idea about um, how my mix compares to the reference. And the first thing I notice here is as soon as I switch over, you can see that actually the mix, um, the readout becomes a little bit more dynamic. It's still pretty squashed, um, but my mix is, a, is currently set, is hitting a five peak to uh, signal ratio, which is, um, it's not a lot of dynamics there. So I'm backing off um, the input gain on the mix bus. And I've also raised the dry level on the solid bus comp, which is, you know, inherently more dynamic, less squashed, because the compressor's output is a more heavily compressed. So those two moves gave me a more uh, dynamic, uh, more punchy input to um, the, uh, the L2 limiter. And additionally, I backed off on the input gain just a little bit so that my peak to signal ratio on the dynamometer matched what I was seeing on my reference.
So that was as far as I got with the mix session today. Um, I could have spent more time on uh, all of these things and it was kind of rushed and I should definitely have spent more time. Um, but uh, I think the, the fundamental strategies and all the different moves that I would do uh, for a mix session like this have been kind of illustrated. Um, fundamentally, it's really just about controlling dynamics. Um, so that's why you saw a lot of uh, yeah, like noise gates and um, dynamic EQ uh, and compressors uh, and um, really I'm just kind of like looking for ways to bring the punch and the spike back into the signal um, while keeping everything kind of clean and full. It's, it's a sort of an even balance between punchy dynamics and squashy dynamics and you want to try and find like a good balance between the two. Um, and obviously, uh, continually checking your references is absolutely essential because, um, you know, you just don't really know where you are. If you're not listening to your references, you could be actually a mile off. Um, so, uh, you know, other things um, to note about the uh, L2 limiter, I will set the dithering on. Um, because I'm going to bounce this out to 16-bit. When I do a master, I, I bounce down to um, either Wave or AIF. I actually prefer AIF these days because you can actually embed metadata into an AIF. You can't do that to a Wave. So um, uh, I set um, dithering on the uh, on the Fab Filter Pro L2 rather than in Logics um, uh, bounce to audio. Um, I'm not sure if the dithering is better on on um, on the fab filter. It's probably exactly the same, but that's what I've been doing. Uh, I bounced out the uh, results and stick the date on it, and we're done.